I wanted to introduce my three friends here and also ask that you maybe just for a little bit, um, maybe empathize with what's going on in the rest of the world. Uh, you know, one thing that we, we do here in the United States is we try to um, control our monetary policy to help people in the United States. And one of the things our government has done is, is raise interest rates, obviously, to try and fight inflation. But that has had a very negative effect on a lot of countries around the world that have a lot of dollar denominated debt and who are now experiencing really incredible rises in the cost of basic goods, uh, whether it be gasoline, uh, rice, uh, just meat, any kind of basic things that people need. Um, so oftentimes we make decisions here and we don't really think about what happens elsewhere. And I think that's one of the reasons you're seeing such an explosion in Bitcoin adoption around the world is that people are opting out into a different system. A lot of times you'll see, uh, countries try to impose capital controls. They're trying to prop up a weak currency. They will come and try and actually take your gold. They'll try and take your U S dollars. They'll try to make U S dollars illegal. Um, they'll try to force you to use a very weak currency. Um, or they'll try to force you, they'll try to force you to use somebody else's currency. Um, and, and for the first time in history, people are able to use mobile phones and internet to access, uh, an asset that cannot be devalued or confiscated if it's used properly. Uh, it gives them real property rights and it gives them free speech. It allows them to transact and it gives them access to open capital markets. So we've never had this before. So it's novel. We're all learning. We're watching this unfold. It's very humbling. Um, but I'm very, I'm very grateful for the Bitcoin innovation because it's allowed people uh, to have a way out in, in a way they've never had before. So that's, that's something I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, by way of introduction, again, my name is Alex. I work at the Human Rights Foundation. We are a nonprofit based in New York that uh, was founded by former political prisoners worldwide. We focus on challenging authoritarianism. Uh, by our count, that's about 4.3 billion people. Uh, in about 95 countries around the world who don't have the same kind of checks and balances against their government power that we do here. Um, so all of our programs are designed to help people who live under uh, authoritarian countries. My friends here uh, all come from places that, that we consider uh, to be authoritarian, and they're going to tell you more about that. And in, in our um, work, we started to notice how money was such an important topic, such an important part of the human rights conversation, but it was so something that people didn't want to necessarily bring up, like it was kind of hidden beneath the surface. Uh, for example, it's really difficult to send money to uh, the three, for example, the three countries that are represented here. Uh, even just basic administrative stuff like sending a grant can be really challenging. So even just the basics of sending money, receiving money, storing money is, is really, really hard for most human rights defenders in the world today. This makes their life like miserable and they have to spend a huge amount of time worrying about uh, even just receiving a grant, uh, storing the money, trying to keep it away from the government so they don't know. Most of these dictatorships have passed various laws about, uh, you know, you're a trader, basically, if you receive a gift from abroad, things like that. So, you know, what we started to notice is that governments increasingly, especially as money has digitized, you know, they really go after people in this way. They, they, the, one of the first things a dictatorship will do to a civil society organization is try to shut down their bank account. You see this everywhere from Hong Kong to Nigeria to Belarus. So again, it's not just the fact that people are, are kind of stuck in weak fiat currencies that are, that are collapsing or that they don't have the same kind of uh, privileges we do in terms of having Venmo and PayPal and having an ease of use. It's also that like activists are actually being targeted financially and, and Bitcoin allows people to, to escape that and keep their work going. So with that, um, I wanted to, to open it up uh, we're going to hear a little bit from Roya Mahboub, from Marina Stefanos, and from Fadi El Salamin. Um, we're going to hear a little bit about who they are, what the work they do. We're going to hear a little bit about how they use Bitcoin, and, and we're going to hear their perspective on why they think Bitcoin is good for the United States and 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 good for American foreign policy. Uh, so with that, we'll start with Roya. Um, welcome, Roya. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank do you, you want to? Uh, and this is a good moment for me, very special, because Roya is basically the person who taught me about Bitcoin. So I'm very grateful for that. She uh, was the crazy person who started using it in 2013 when it wasn't worth anything at all and was very sketchy. Uh, but she uh, figured out how to use it because, because she had to. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about who you are, where you come from, what you're doing. Um, and I'm sure the audience would love to hear. Sure. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here today. I'm Rio Mahal. I'm from Afghanistan. And uh, my story started from 
2003 when there is an Indian cafe was opened up in Herat and uh, and I heard about this magic box that people connect you with the world and I was just excited about that and that's how I get connected and uh, I decided to make technology be the center of my career. I went to university, I graduated thanks to the Americans that they provided us a great opportunity at the time. And um, so uh, I started my company and then later on I started my nonprofit organization because I believe that there are millions of the girls who are like me, they are curious about giving a Norwegian to explore the world. And I just wanted to give them the same tools that has changed my life, my personal life and my professional life. And that's why we built Digital Citizen Fund to give the access to technology and an opportunity for the young women in developing countries like Afghanistan. We built IT centers inside of the public schools and we teach young girls at the age of 12 to 18 to learn about basic things, to learn about computer, to level off that they can learn about robotics, they learn about blockchain, they learn, they learn about the financial literacy. We help 17,000 of the girls to come to our program. We help uh, hundreds of them to study their own startups. And um, I don't know how much you heard about Afghan Girls Robotic Team. That's also another project that is um, uh, involved uh, from, um, from our program. Yeah, so just to recap from my perspective, uh, you know, Roya was named by Time Magazine as, as one of the most 100 influential people in the world. Uh, who, who wrote your, your little bio for you? Sheryl Sandberg. Sheryl Sandberg, yep, that's, that's pretty nice. Uh, it was a, an, an honor for her to do it, I'm sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, what, what uh, we observed when we first met Roya was that she was one of Afghanistan's first female technology CEOs and ran an all-female all tech company doing software services. Um, I think what most people maybe miss about um, the Bitcoin thing is just how it, 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 can, it, it really is a tool for helping people who are disenfranchised, right, or vulnerable, right? So you were trying to pay the women who worked for you and the existing system was hard, right? Because you were telling me that when you tried to pay them in, in, ca in cash, like the male relatives would take the money away. They weren't really allowed to open bank accounts, but they had phones, right? Like Facebook was happening. It was a thing back then. So people had phones. So you could pay them in Bitcoin. So you said, why not, right? And it's really interesting because when, when she started paying the employees in Bitcoin, Bitcoin was worth $100. And by the end of the year, Bitcoin was worth $1,000. So she thought, of course, that this was like the greatest thing ever. Little did she know Bitcoin would crash back down to $200. So she got like the full roller coaster experience. Now, most people would, would obviously quit at that point. They would say the thing's failed. I'm going to move on. But you didn't. And you stuck with it. And your sister uh, didn't quit either. And your sister had this little side business, right, where she, when women wanted to buy something, your sister would, would, um, would buy the Bitcoin from them, right? What's amazing, I think, about your sister's story also is that she ended up used, saving that Bitcoin and, and financing her college education with it several years later, which is really cool. She ended up going to Cornell. Um, so what, 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 why did you not quit um, when you saw the Bitcoin price crash? And it, it, kind, of, it, it kind of ruined your company in some ways. What, what, why did you um, not quit? Like what, what, what kept you interested in it? So I will a little bit explain that how we get involved with, uh, um, uh, with Bitcoin. We build in a platform that allows women to write the blogs and they get paid based off uh, on their social impact of their creative ideas. But this, um, and this uh, work that we done it in Afghanistan and Pakistan, we had increased the number of our users and employees that they're writing these blogs. But the issue was that the, many of these women didn't have a bank account. Because in our society, it's not only because uh, they are poor or they don't have money or they don't have an ID or the bank has a lot of like restriction, but also because the families and the, the, the men don't want that the women have a bank account because they wanted to control the finance of the women. And uh, so that was an issue. We have to pay these women uh, by cash. And many of the time when you have to take the monies from the bank, uh, if people know that you have a lot of cash with you, and there is a chief, there is a kidnapping happening, and that was always not uh, safe to have a lot of cash, especially in Afghanistan at the time. And then if you send the monies to the like a rural area or to outside of like a Herat, you send to Kandahar, you send to other places, there is um, uh, there is middlemen that they take some part of the money, and the women's um, there is no transparency if the women receive the money. There is always the cost always get get increased and. And then we tried to use the uh, mobile money, but mobile money didn't work in Afghanistan at the time. It was a very successful project in Kenya and other countries, but it wasn't really uh, uh, operated very well in Afghanistan. And then we took to thinking about PayPal, but PayPal was banned in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So then we heard about Bitcoin. And obviously that I feel that this is something that um, 
is magic. It's like like the 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 magic box that I uh, heard it in uh, 2003, and now in 2013 we heard about Bitcoin, and then we decided, okay, why not we don't use uh, Bitcoin? And that's how we implemented and developed a platform um, that we paying people in Bitcoin. Bitcoin actually uh, bypass our physical and social barriers to paying the women. And I feel that um, Bitcoin is a safeguard of human rights and promotes the freedom. One of the women that you worked with had to escape, right, for political reasons. And she was able to keep her Bitcoin with her. Um, it's pretty trivial to store your Bitcoin uh, with a seed phrase, which is uh, 12 or 24 words, right? So, you know, you can leave Afghanistan. You have to go through Iran, through Turkey. You have to get on a boat. It's harrowing. Most people don't make it. But you can either memorize 12 words. And, and before you say, oh, that sounds ridiculous. Remember, there's 10 million Muslims who've memorized the entire Quran in the world today. So you can, you can memorize 12 words, trust me, uh, especially if your life depends on it. Um, so, you know, your friend, uh, you know, we won't get into exactly how she did it. Uh, but let's just say she could have memorized it. She could have kept it on a USB key. She could have s literally emailed the, you know, password to her friend in America. There's a lot of ways you can protect your Bitcoin, but she escaped from this place uh, and was able to put all of her value into this asset. And then eventually she made it to Germany and she was able to start a new life with the Bitcoin. So the existing financial system doesn't permit that sort of thing. It's not possible. And this is, this is a pretty big deal. Um, now. Uh, today, post the fall of Kabul, um, Bitcoin is allowing you to, to, to continue to finance your operations. And to be clear, Roya is responsible for the training and education of thousands of girls and women in Afghanistan. And, you know, it's very difficult to do that if you can't pay them. So today you're using Bitcoin. I know that Bitcoin and stable coins uh, are very important for this. So do you just want to talk about that briefly? Sure. I mean, after the collapse of the Kabul, um, which it was very sad uh, to see after 20 years of the golden era in Afghanistan, everything's end. Um, so you know that the banking system is collapsed and then it was very difficult for the families and organization to send aids to Afghanistan. The Western Union didn't work. They were ran out of the cash and, and it was very difficult at the time. And uh, one third of the population starving uh, from not having enough foods and uh, and uh, 70 to 60 percent of the people didn't had didn't had money to pay for your due rents. It was very chaos and uncertainty happening. And the only things that it did during that time was remind safe. It was cryptocurrency. With cryptocurrency, you could send the money and for the people who get evacuated at the time for the saving houses and also for the people who had uh, um, access to technology and uh, cell phone. You could just simply send the Bitcoin and they can. Bitcoin or stable coins that they can pay for their food. So you told me something that was a personal thing, that, but I wrote about it in a story uh, that you're featured in, that you tried to convince your parents uh, earlier that year to, to buy Bitcoin so that just in case, and, and they were, you were unsuccessful. So when they fled Afghanistan, they couldn't bring their money with them and they lost it. And I thought that was pretty, that's a pretty powerful little story. Like, but you were successful in teaching a lot of other people. And when that's the I important part. I couldn't get with my mom because she, <laughs> she, she believes on something that she can touch and believe on cash, not and kept. And she saw that how the Bitcoin goes up and down, how is it? It's affected my business and everything. So she didn't want to be that risky. And uh, when she was evacuated, they basically left the country with nothing. They couldn't take them their monies from the bank. They took, they didn't take anything. It's not their house, nothing. So everything get freeze by the camera regime and uh, my mom lost everything. And so I think that uh, that was very sad. Yeah. And to be fair and balanced, like we can praise the U.S. government for the investment in women in Afghanistan like that. That's a massive victory. And that was a great use of our foreign policy. Uh, that's what Roya will tell you. Um, but to be fair and balanced, like freezing the money of the Afghan people was was a shameful and embarrassing thing that's led to a lot of people suffering. So. It's interesting that, you know, we came in, we did this great thing for women in that country, and then we left and, you know, people are kind of in the lurch. And one of the ways you can continue doing your work is through Bitcoin. So I, I feel like a lot of people didn't know that. It's an important story. Thank you for doing what you're doing. I appreciate it. Thank I, you. It's, it's very important. Um, uh, Marin, uh, it's, it's an honor for us to have you here. Um, why don't you introduce yourself to tell the audience a little bit about, about what you do? Uh, thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Uh, my name is Meron Estefanos. I'm uh, originally from Eritrea. And I left when I was at 12 to Sweden because my father was uh, an activist. He had to flee the country. So 
we later joined him. And I've been living in Sweden ever since. Uh, so I did not have any connection to my country since I lived in Eritrea. Eritrea did not even exist at that time. And after independence, later on in life, I went to Eritrea trying to live there and saw that it was a dictatorship. So I came back to Sweden and I became an activist. Uh, and, and I saw how nobody was writing about Eritrea. Eritrea was not being covered anywhere. So I joined this movement and we started a radio that would broadcast into Eritrea uh, via satellite and shortwave. Uh, so I, you know, I start covering refugee-related issues in my program, which was Voices of Eritrean Refugees. And, and, and to be clear, how many people today listen to you every week? Uh, inside Eritrea, half a million people. And what's the total population in Eritrea? About 3.5. So she's like the Joe Rogan of Eritrea. <laughs> the serious. Even bigger, actually, by percentage. <laughs> no, but like half a million people are like listening to her. It's amazing. She just does amazing work. So that's just one, one part of it, though. Yeah. But then you also were compelled to try and address the issue of refugees, right? So covering the refugee issues, which was supposed to be one program, but I ended up getting stuck because I felt so sorry. The refugees that I was talking to were kidnapped uh, in Sudan and sold to the, to the Egyptians as slaves and, and, and families have to buy them out, which costs like uh, minimum ransom is $33,000 a person up to $70,000 a person. And we are the poorest of the poorest. And, and to be clear, like people are fleeing from this regime because it has a totally mandatory military service for your entire life, right? In as different. well as no information, no access to outside information, arbitrary arrests anytime this person wants to arrest anybody. It's a totalitarian, I mean, people call it the North Korea of Africa. So people are fleeing just like they flee from Cuba or North Africa, except instead of going on a raft to Miami or fleeing into China, People are fleeing north through the desert or south, like, you know, to try to get to a place like Kenya, but they're going to go north and they're going to try to go to Israel or they're going to try to go to Europe. Right. And along the way, they get kidnapped and people like basically, are, you know, put a gun to their head and they say, call your family who you're going to. And they do the phone call and they say, you need to send me money or we're going to kill this person. And you step in at that point and, and, and you try to rescue them. Right. Yeah, you know, at, at the beginning, when I first interviewed these hostages, I just felt like if the world knew about them, uh, this would have stopped right away, you know. And so I start contacting U.S. State Department, European Union, all organizations, those anti-trafficking uh, anti organizations, but nobody cared. So one by one, the people that I interviewed start dying. In, five, in three weeks, five died of the people that I interviewed. And I just couldn't let them die anymore. And I start raising funds to, to pay for their ransoms. I don't even know how many millions I've paid. But uh, you've raised millions of dollars for this. Yes, yeah. yes. And before Bitcoin, like how would you uh, get the money to where it needed to go and kind of what were some of your challenges? That was the hardest part. Uh, I had the money to pay for the person, to free a person, but sending the money was a, the most difficult part because... Western Union at that time was charging 20 or 25 percent, and also the limit was four thousand five hundred dollars, and MoneyGram was seven thousand five hundred, I think. And after paying two or three ransoms for three people, MoneyGram called me and said, "You're not welcome to use our services anymore." So the only option became um, Western Union, and with Western Union, it's only four thousand five hundred dollars. Uh, so you have I have to do two two chunks to, or three yeah, chunks. Yeah, and imagine you're trying to pay seventy thousand dollars. So I had to. And you have a certain number of hours before the person yeah, gets killed. Yeah, an hour and a half. Often they give you an hour and a half. Uh, and they have networks all over the world. Uh, I once had, like, I was told to pay an, uh, in an hour and a half $33,000. Uh, and they wanted me to pay the money in Sweden to some people. And so they kept texting, you have an hour left, you have 30 minutes left. And, and I couldn't get the money in an hour and a half. And an 18-year-old uh, young man was killed because... I didn't pay in time, even though we had the money, but it was just impossible. Uh, and the traffickers don't think logic, how it's difficult to send money quickly. They don't care about the excuse. No, they don't. So you now, you've now you now started using Bitcoin for this purpose, and it's saving lives. There's no exaggeration, right? Yes. So once um, Alex Gladstone introduced me to Bitcoin, which I <laughs> highly appreciate. Thank you for that. Uh, and then I just saw how easy it was. It just clicked and I, I, I said, this can actually solve. And, and now what I do is, uh, if someone is kidnapped, we can get the money in less than half an hour actually and, 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 uh, get it in cash. Um, so 
it has made my life much easier and, and it saves like we're not teaching the traffickers to accept them the Bitcoin. We're just teaching someone else, family members on how they can send them money quickly and it arrives in Sudan quickly. And then I also teach them on how to convert it into cash and pay on time for their laptop. So this is just it's a tool. Bitcoin's a tool like anything else, like the internet, but it makes you a more efficient rescuer is the Very. point. And I know I always embarrass you by asking you, but uh, can you give us some insight into how many people you've helped rescue? Total. Oh, I, it's, uh, I don't know, 30, 40,000 at sea, and I don't know how many hostages. Uh... Um, so you are like a woman of many different uh, talents. So you're, you're educating uh, millions of people. You're rescuing tens of thousands of people. But now you're also building community in East Africa, right? So you're starting a Bitcoin educational center in Uganda. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, we're opening a bit. Because this is where a lot of Horn, Horn of Africa refugees go, right? They go to Central Africa, they go to Kenya, Uganda, et cetera, right? Yeah. Uh, so the refugee community, uh, often when they leave their country, they don't live with ID or anything else, or it's often lost on the way. And uh, they live off remittance. Uh, but the problem is they don't know how to receive money. Either they will accept in Hawala, but just a few weeks ago, um, refugees that were supposed to receive money for Easter, the person uh, doing the hawala disappeared with $7 million of Eritrean money. Uh, so it, it keeps happening, this kind of thing. So I felt like the refugees is good to teach them, at least they can accept in Bitcoin. And, and, and so thanks to that, so they're teaching their loved ones in the West, actually the people in Africa are teaching their loved ones in US and in Europe on how to send Bitcoin because they prefer to accept it in Bitcoin where they don't have to show ID or they don't have to open a bank account. And they don't need, yeah, they don't need ID. They don't have a, they don't need a bank account. It's permissionless. And, and this is a feature. I think we often think about it as a bug because we're sort of trained to think that money that the government doesn't control is bad, is criminal. But for most of the world, money that the government doesn't control is vital because the government's not a good government. Like, again, most people live under an authoritarian regime, not a democracy. So it's very important for us to have money that anybody can access on the internet that the government doesn't control. And we are very privileged to think that money on the internet that the government doesn't control is bad or criminal. That's only something you could possibly conclude if you live in a rich Western privileged society. But for most of the people in the world today, the, you know, you have about a billion people who live in a liberal democracy with property rights who have a reserve currency, about a billion people. Then everybody else, you know, close to 7 billion lives either in an authoritarian regime or a country with weak currency. So for the vast majority of the world's population, this is, this is a big, big deal, um, especially for people uh, working with, in, 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 in Fadi's struggle. So uh, Fadi, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, right, your, your background, what you do? Um, I, I think people are very interested to hear. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Um, I have Maron always on speed dial, and I think you should as well. Uh, speak they, up, speak up. I said I, ha I have. Thank you so thank much, you, Alex. Bob. Alex has been my teacher on, <laughs> on on Bitcoin, but I said I have Maron on uh, speed dial in case you never know. Yeah, and Roya also, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. But, um, my name is Fadi Al Salamin. I've uh, I always describe that the three reasons why somebody like me who grew up in uh, in Hebron in, in the West Bank as a Palestinian uh, would ever use Bitcoin. And the three reasons are my, my grandmother, um, corruption and, and, and politics. And, and I'll explain in, in details. Um, my grandmother lived to until about 95 years old. She um, lived through five or six different regimes, um, the Ottoman Empire, the British, the Jordanians, the Israelis, the Palestinian Authority. And she always had uh, this dress on, on her head that had coins on it. And I, I always call her the original coin holder in the family. She was the first person to, to do it. And these were like made of what? These were go gold, gold uh, yeah. and, and, and silver. And whenever they were forced to move, she's never had a bank account ever. Uh, and whenever we were forced to move, that was her asset. That was her bank account. That was when she had to pay off somebody or she wanted to buy a new lot of land or, or whatever. That's what she needed to, to use. So I, I know that if she was alive today, she would be the first person to say, where's your Bitcoin? Make sure it's always on you. All right. 
So that's that's the first reason. The, the other reason is is corruption, and I think this ex, this example applies everywhere. It's not just uh, in, in Palestine. I started an anti-corruption campaign highlighting the misuse of uh, foreign aid within the Palestinian Authority around 12 years ago. And later on, I realized that that was not a good idea. It's not. <laughs> I thought I was doing a great thing. <laughs> Next thing I noticed was the president is not happy with me. The Palestinian Authority is not happy with me. Uh, apparently, corrupt guys hate it if you try to point out the corruption. Um, I know we're coming to this realization in Washington, D.C. in 2023, but it, it's a true story. So, you know, a million people later following me on Facebook, um, a lot of people obviously are, you know, surprised to learn about the amount of corruption, but the way it's done and it's done in a very sophisticated way. Trust me, they could teach Ph.D. courses on how to steal and siphon off um, foreign aid. And this is really important for USAID and, and Treasury people who are in the room. And what happened as a result, you know, I woke up one day, um, my bank account was completely shut down. Um, I'm no longer allowed to have a bank account. But every single piece of information I had ever given to my bank has been taken by the intelligence services who work for the Palestinian president, including a copy of my U.S. passport, my very de like personal details and was given to a newspaper that is owned by Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization funded by Iran. And in one day, four articles in Al-Akhbar newspaper about me, how I am this dangerous guy who's trying to point out corruption, but really have ulterior, ulterior motives. So all of a sudden, the bank that was supposed to protect my privacy, um, you know, completely gave out all my information with no legal precedent whatsoever. And I was framed as this, terrible guy whose, you know, crime is pointing out corruption. So um, Alex said, hey, I, I think you're a moron. You should use Bitcoin. <laughs> he said it in a much nicer way, but, and it's, it's true. I was like, what do you mean Bitcoin? I don't well, explain it. So we've spent many hours and, and it, it makes complete sense. I don't have to be under the mercy of a corrupt regime. Um, I can send Bitcoin directly. Um, my wire transfers are not intercepted. Uh, they're not uh, used against me. And, and by the way, you know, I, I'm giving you the very short version of what happened with the bank. The bank asked for a bribe. You know, they were trying to come to me before the freeze happened. They were like, we want to, you know, we want to be really nice, but would you pay this amount of money as a bribe? And I say, I'm the guy who's fighting corruption. You want me to get out of this by paying a bribe? No, you have to pay twice as much, actually. It, that's actually was the second, when I said no the first time, they was like, okay, well, the bribe went up. It's actually, now yeah, it's not this amount, it's this high amount. So I have a bank account who's frozen right now, but, you know, but, but that's actually, it, I was like forced. And I'm saying I'm not a unique case. This happens in almost every country where there's a repressive yeah. regime. And, and we, we forget that like the financial system exists uh, to create intermediaries in a way. If you read the Bitcoin white paper, like the first, paragraph talk, is it Satoshi talks about how they're trying to make basically digital money for the world without intermediaries. And, you know, maybe we think of intermediaries as good guys here, you know, your local bank, your trustworthy bank, like the regulatory, uh, regulatory authorities who are going to, you know, FDIC bail you out in case something happens. Like we, we have maybe a positive, you know, view of, of third parties here in the United States, but like in most places, third parties are rent seeking, corrupt, uh, censorious authorities. And that's exactly what you all are, are dealing with. The number of mm. activists who've had their bank accounts frozen um, just keeps growing by the day, whether they be human rights activists or environmental activists or labor rights activists. I mean, these people are, are all going to get targeted. Um, and it's not just that, like, the average Palestinian encounters enormous issues just sending money back home or sending a grant to support something. Uh, it, it's also that, you know, we should just briefly touch on the fact that you don't even have your own currency. Um, right. and we won't go too deep into it, but the point is during the Oslo Accords process, there was something that people normally don't know about called the Paris Protocol that Arafat signed, which basically gave away Palestinian sovereignty over money as part of the deal. So they have to use the Israeli currency and they have no control over any, any, any sort of, um, they have no control over any sort of uh, monetary freedom. 
And that must be pretty heavy to have to like use, you know, the, you know, some other country's money, right? That's a little, right. you know, that's a little rough. So, so that's another context here is that they've never had their own currency. It is exactly true. I, it, w one thing I wanted to point out, you know, if you live in DC, it's easy. You know, you have a bank account, you can go to Wells Fargo, withdraw, you can transfer, you can, it's a totally different game over there. Um, an intelligence officer, if they're corrupt and they really know that you're a thriving business and they want um, part of your money, they can just walk into the bank and say, show me what he has, you know, then they'll call you up, you know, intimidate you, ask for a bribe. And so the idea of banking privacy laws does not exist, right? So it's hard to compare when you're existing in a society here where there are checks and balances, laws, regulations, et cetera, in a different world, completely different story. And, and, on the politics yeah. side, sorry, Alex, yeah. but on, on, the, on the politics side, I, I, I completely agree. We had the Oslo Accords, which was signed here in D.C., September 13, 1993, um, at the White House. And 30 years later, Israelis and Palestinians will tell you, oh, the, the peace agreement is dead. The, there's no uh, two-state solution. They'll give you all this, the, the spiel. But you know what's alive and still alive is the Paris Accords, which is the financial arrangement where um, there's no monetary policy. The, and it's still like one system. So either the politics follows the money or the money follows the politics, but you can't have those yeah, two. Yeah, and then any yeah. aid that goes to Palestine has to go through Israel first. And it's right. it's interesting because Israel basically takes the Forex, they take the Canadian dollars or the US dollars or the Euros, and then they print shekels and give them to the PA. So it's an interesting little um, uh, arrangement they have. We'll, we'll just leave it at that. Um, mm -hmm. So a couple things. Uh, we were wrapping up here. We have about five minutes left. I, I wanted to touch on two, two items here for, for as takeaways. Uh, the scale of Bitcoin adoption is so staggering. Uh, we were in um, Ghana in December at the Africa Bitcoin Conference organized by a uh, democracy movement in West Africa because 15 African countries still use a French colonial currency and have no control over their own money. So they're, they're very into Bitcoin because it gives them monetary freedom. And monetary freedom has been a big part of the African democracy movement, actually. Uh, one of the main reasons you see democracy movements in West Africa is because People have been living under this French currency that they have no control over. And people organized this event. We all went down there. And it was, it was, it was fascinating to see uh, <laughs> meeting people from Benin, Cameroon, Malawi, the Congo, Somalia, Somaliland, like places I barely even knew about. There are thriving Bitcoin communities. I met a guy who runs a business in Somalia off remittances. This is one of the main use cases out there is people receive Bitcoin or stable coins from their family. And then these companies off ramp it into the local currency in cash. They have tens of thousands of clients in these places. There's circular communities going on. It's, it's just staggering, like the jaw drops. There's a guy from South Africa who invented a way for people to use Bitcoin without the internet by using something called USSD, which is a text message based protocol. So you have a feature phone that has no internet and you can text a number and a password and you can have Bitcoin and you can send it anywhere in the world. This is totally invented over there. Um, we, we met folks working on uh, renewable mining in Eastern Africa. So they'll go to a place with no electricity. They'll set a little micro hydro into the ground off of a river and they'll get and, and, and without charity, they're, they're making money. They'll electrify a village. And this is happening all across East Africa. It's amazing what you see out there. So just don't underestimate the global scope here. I mean, we're talking, you know, between Bitcoin and stable coins we're probably above a half billion people who've, who've used these things. If you start looking at countries like India and Indonesia alone have massive cryptocurrency communities. Um, I mean, we know that one country, El Salvador, uh, has adopted Bitcoin. We know the Central African Republic has adopted it. We know a couple other countries have. But, but like there are more Indian Bitcoiners alone than, than the entire amounts of population in these countries. Like, so the scale's really big, number one. So I don't know if any of you want to comment on that. There's one example. It, it... First of all, it was amazing to be able to buy um, art at, from directly from the artist using Bitcoin in Ghana. But there's one example I want to You didn't to have mention. to like call your bank ahead of time to tell them you're going to Ghana? No, no nothing at all. It was just immediate 10 <laughs> seconds and it was unbelievable. There's one example I think that applies to many of the people in the room who are dealing with on the government side. The government of Germany asked some of, of us who are dealing with Bitcoin to come up with a solution where they are able to pay remittances to Holocaust survivors who are living in Russia, who cannot, who can no longer receive bank transfers anymore. And they're looking for ways how to use Bitcoin to pay um, Holocaust survivors who are, who are living there. 
So the applications are, you know, wide, enormous. It's not just, you know, I know many people in government think, oh, Bitcoin is a way to avoid sanctions. It's actually a way, in this case, it's a way to comply with sanctions and not use banks because that's the issue. Uh, and be able to pay people who are uh, who need yeah, the money. Yeah, like how do you send value to Cuba or Russia without enriching Putin or the Castros with Bitcoin? Like this is, you know, we sit here and we dither and we argue about Cuba policy. And mean, in the meantime, Bitcoin is helping people every day. So I, I think it's it's kind of inspiring in that way. So um, don't underestimate the global scope. Don't underestimate the the power it has as a human rights tool. And remember, it's it's tremendously valuable. I mean, people, anyone who says Bitcoin's a waste of energy doesn't know what they're talking. I mean, they're ignorant. They don't know what they're talking about. I mean, it's a, it's a very valuable tool for tens of millions of people worldwide, and that's only going to increase. I mean, the only way you're going to like see Bitcoin go away is if governments magically become uh, issuers of sound money that's non-confiscatable and non-censorable and fair for everybody. And that's not going to happen. So, you know, you're just going to see this become more and more and more valuable as we see more devaluation of currency worldwide and more deplatforming. As you see more of those things happen, you're going to see more Bitcoin adoption. The last thing I wanted to end on was energy use, just because I think it's, it's fascinating to, to, to think about this. Like people say it's a waste of energy, it uses too much energy. You know, people, most people in the world don't have enough energy. This idea that like we should reduce our energy use is it could only possibly come from a rich advanced country. So I wanted to hear uh, everybody weigh in a little bit on that before we conclude. So just just your very quick 30 seconds on on what your opinion is that we have to, people in the West are always trying to defend the energy usage of Bitcoin? I think because they're born in privileged societies and they haven't been in our countries that we don't have electricity most of the time. And I think that uh, you are using electricity for your jet, using for your cruise, you're using for your everything. You have AC, you have uh, uh, using to washing your dresses, but, um, but many of our people, billions of the people, they don't have this and they don't use it. But Bitcoin is actually helping them. 1.7 billion of the people are unbanked and they don't have uh, any banks, but then they can use the cryptocurrencies as a way that to create their own bank. And billions of the people living under authoritarian regime that they are controlling their finance. So, yeah, just as a reminder, air conditioners in the United States of America use way more energy than all three of their countries combined. In fact, more than the bottom 50 countries. Um, Marin. Uh, now that I'm living in Africa, I see a lot of people without electricity on a daily basis, even in cities. Uh, and I'm looking into mining Bitcoin myself so that I can provide electricity to villages that don't have electricity while doing uh, the mining. So um, I, I do not believe this uh, too much energy things. Yes, as Roya said, in the West, yes, a lot of energy is being wasted. But when you are looking at Africa, you know, even cities like big cities, you will have six hours power outage on a daily basis. Um, I, I'll do even a, a reverse example. Look at Ethiopia, a country of over 100 million people. They have the cleanest and cheapest electricity in the world. They're about, or they're already beginning to produce about 6,000 megawatts out of the Renaissance Dam. There's a lot of excess electricity there. While mining, people are starving nearby. Yeah, so mining Bitcoin is a no-brainer. It's something that you should, you know, if you really want to help your economy, that's something you can do. Uh, right there. Yeah, and it, it, it's Bitcoin mining is all about what what kind of energy is it using, and you know what it happens to be a, a consumer, a user of energy that that happens to be using a lot of renewable energy, and that's going to increase. So you know we think it's going to be really interesting to see the impact it has on many countries around the world that don't currently have the ability to harness these vast amounts of solar, geothermal, uh, wind, you know, resources, and and Bitcoin mining is going to help unlock that. So that's quite cool. So just as a closing thought. Um, when you, you, you think about America and American values and American foreign policy, you know, we think about things like democracy, freedom, human rights. You know, oftentimes our foreign policy has sort of failed to achieve that. Sometimes it succeeded. Um, but regardless, you know, I, we think you should view Bitcoin as an ally here. I mean, it gives individuals property rights and free speech and it helps push them, push power back. It helps them kind of take a little power back from from their governments. So it's a very, very American thing. So, you know, we sh we think that it's going to be a very valuable tool in, in, in American foreign policy moving forward, um, and especially in democracy promotion. So thank you all very much for, for having us. And thanks to the organizers for giving my friends a voice. Thank you. Thank you.